In the 1800s, mainly the workers that were needed here were hotel workers. The Irish, of course, were moving to Philadelphia and New York, and they weren't particularly liked, and, but they were needed here, so they found the place. The same was with the Italian community, and besides that, this was a place where post-Civil War African Americans could move and be tremendously valued as uh, employees, and so work was found where it might not be so easy to find it in other areas. In, as I looked through the 18, late 1800 censuses from 1850 on, I was particularly looking to track the Italian-American community. But what I saw pattern-wise was all the ethnic communities or racial communities were moving in. And interestingly enough, before the 1910 census, census figure, they have not ghettoized. Now, when I say ghettoized, I don't mean anything bad by that word. Uh, ghettoizing is simply people of a like nature moving in together. You get an Irish neighborhood, a black neighborhood, an Italian neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood, etc. Uh, and they were not ghettoizing in Atlantic City. The, the, neighbors, the, the neighborhoods were all mixed, according to the censuses. But by, from 1900 to 1910, and Tony may know what happened here, and they ghettoized, and the Italians took over Ducktown, the Irish took over Lower Atlantic City, the Jewish community took over the inlet, and then finally parts of Margate. The black community took in what was called either the north side or the west side, and each of those areas had their own culture, their own stores, their own businesses, their own activities, and uh, that is how Atlantic City came into the 20th century, into the early 1900s. Tony. What happened from there? Well, uh, we talked earlier about how transportation changed. Atlantic City, as you mentioned, was a railroad town. It was, uh, it was really the closest point uh, to the ocean from Philadelphia, as some people called it the lungs of Philadelphia. And when people worked in the factories there, uh, <clears throat> conditions were pretty brutal. And uh, so, uh, um, a, so they valued a trip to Atlantic City, and the, the shoebox became became uh, became their uh, their <clears throat> their conveyance of all their valuables, uh, uh, and uh, so they uh, th that's where the term shoeby kind of uh, developed, and uh, so for uh, for a small fee they could get an excursion to Atlantic City and get a, a dip in the in the cool salt water and uh, some fresh air. And so a lot of them, uh, for a lot of them, it was Sunday because that was the day, uh, that was the day when a lot of the, fact, most of the factories were closed. So that was a big, big excursion day. But since Atlantic City was a railroad town, uh, the early uh, developments centered around the, the railroad line, of course, and, and the early hotels uh, were built or sponsored by, the, ho by the, the railroads. The excursion house was one of the first and then the other big hotel was the United States Hotel that Norman mentioned earlier. The coming of the railroad would bring a new life to the shore region and usher in a period of tremendous growth and development. In 1830, Absecum Island was considered a long stretch of worthless marshland and barren sand dunes. About a half dozen houses inhabited the island. Most of them occupied by members of the Leeds family. Inspired by its warm ocean breezes and fresh salty air, Dr. Jonathan Pitney, a prominent physician living on the mainland, began to recognize the island for its healing and rejuvenating health benefits. He became convinced that it had the perfect climate for a health resort. Along with his friend, Richard Osborne, they devised a plan to bring the railroad to Absecon. In 1830, 
and in 1852, construction began on the Camden Atlantic City Railroad. On July 5th, 1854, crowds gathered in eager anticipation as they welcomed the arrival of the first train to the ocean celebrating the birth of Atlantic City. Early passengers on these trains were not exactly treated to deluxe transportation. The engine was often a smoky wood burner. Most of the cars were open coaches. Seats were made out of plain wooden boards and the tracks had no signals of any kind. Despite these discomforts, the coming of the railroad would bring tremendous growth and prosperity to the region. By 1859, Atlantic City had 130 buildings, two first-class hotels, and several smaller ones. The first few years did not come without adversity, however. Hotels had no screens on the windows to protect from the constant onslaught of flies and mosquitoes. The only bathing facility for guests was the ocean. And with hotels located hundreds of yards from the surf, visitors were forced to struggle over dunes and swamps to reach the ocean. In August of 1858, swarms of greenhead flies and mosquitoes were so voracious and unbearable. Horses covered with blood laid down in the streets and cattle waded into the ocean to escape the torture. Houses, hotels, and boarding houses were surrounded with bonfires in hopes that the smoke would drive them off. Often called the father and founder of Atlantic City, Dr. Pitney was in charge of laying out the city's framework and giving the streets their names. Roads running parallel to the ocean were named after the world's great bodies of water. Pacific, Atlantic, Baltic, Mediterranean, Adriatic, and Arctic, while the streets running east to west were named after the states. The first commercial hotel on the island was named the Bellow House. Built in 1853 at Massachusetts and Atlantic Avenue, before long, larger hotels and boarding houses were opening up all over town. There was the Chalfont and Haddon Hall, the Ocean House, the Surf House, the Shelbourne, And to attract visitors, the railroad company built the magnificent United States Hotel, which took up an entire city block. These grand new hotels were elegant, luxurious, and featured the most modern, updated amenities. In 1860s Atlantic City, Guests walked from their hotels and boarding houses to the beach, where rows of bathhouses would be awaiting them. At the end of the season, these changing facilities were put onto wagons and hauled away from the high winter waves. By the 1880s, permanent bathhouses 
had been built on foundations that sunk deep into the sand. The first boardwalk in Atlantic City was nothing more than a succession of wooden planks laid along the beach. The idea was to keep people's feet out of the sand and to keep the sand out of hotels and rail cars. In 1870, Alexander Boardman, a conductor on the Atlantic City Camden Railroad, came up with the idea for a boardwalk that was eight feet wide with most of it lying flat on the sand. It extended from the lighthouse to Missouri Avenue. During the winter season, the walk was taken up and piled into sections. Atlantic City's first official boardwalk opened on June 26, 1870, and can legitimately be called the first boardwalk constructed in the United States. The hard work and labor that went into creating Atlantic City was done almost entirely by African Americans arriving from the South. They laid the tracks that brought the first railroad, built the hotels, and worked in the service industry, catering to the predominantly white visitors bringing enormous contributions to Atlantic City's development. As the resort grew, more and more service jobs became available. By 1885, more than 1,200 African Americans were making Atlantic City their home. Most of them settling on the north side. 30 years later, Blacks would make up one quarter of the population. The first overland road to the island was completed in 1870. Running from Pleasantville, it included a 30 cent toll. Atlantic City's population would more than quadruple over the next decade. Advertised as the Royal Route to the Sea, in 1877, the Philadelphia and Atlantic Railroad was completed. The third railroad to the resort was built in 1880. After the boardwalk was damaged and rebuilt following several severe storms, a new reinforced one was built in 1890. Constructed on wooden pilings, it was the first to have railings after a few strollers had fallen off. It was said that most of them were flirting. They fell off when they turned around to get another wink or smile. The first amusement ride on the boardwalk was erected in 1871. A thriller called the Epicycloidal Wheel. It was essentially the forerunner of the Ferris Wheel. In 1896, the walk was widened to 40 feet in its main section and extended to the length of four miles. A few years later, it was joined with Ventners and then Margates, providing an eight mile walk along the oceanfront of Absecon Island. This boardwalk was the forerunner of the one we have today. Constructed 60 feet wide and six miles long. Its planks placed in a herringbone pattern and laid on a substructure of steel and concrete. Steel railings were erected to keep visitors from falling off to the beach below. In 
hotels, restaurants, and shops were kept on one side of the boards, with amusement piers on the other. Anyone who owned property fronting the boardwalk could erect a pier out into the ocean. These new amusement piers of Atlantic City would become entertainment meccas moving in to the 20th century. On Wednesday, June 16, 1880, Atlantic City was formally opened with fanfare the likes few had ever seen. A spectacular new resort was born. By the census of 1900, there were over 27,000 residents in Atlantic City, up from a mere 250 just 45 years before.